Welcome, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, friends of UFRO and newcomers to the first of a series of plenary uh, um, sessions that we'll have daily. And the first one concerns an issue that is very much um, in the field of forest products, but of course, it's also related to other fields of the division of UFRO. My name is Andrew Wong. I'm the Division 5, which is Forest Products Coordinator. And I would like to take this opportunity to introduce our first distinguished speaker, plenary speaker, who has many years of experience in designing um, timber structures, right? An application aspect of the Forest Products Research Group. Just a little bit about our speaker, Professor Andy Buchanan. He hails from New Zealand. He has a Bachelor of Engineering in Earthquake Engineering, very relevant in an area where it is prone to earthquakes. He has a Master's in Fire Safety in Buildings that covers the, the subject very well. And he is a designer in the steel and concrete industry at one point. And um, at some stage in his career, he, was, he began to, sh to have interest <coughs> in conservation timber conservation, forest conservation, and associated with sustainability of the use of the wood resources. So he did his PhD um, in UBC in the field of timber engineering. And, and he now works in the University of Canterbury in New Zealand, in South Island, and specializing in multi-story timber buildings and structural engineering. Um, while there's a lot about him that I'm unable to address at this moment because I would like to give him more air time to share with you his experience. And for that reason, let's all put our hands together to welcome Professor Andy Buchanan to give us a talk. Thank you. Well, good morning. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a, it's a real honor and a privilege to be here. Um, I've got the first plenary session, and I'm going to tell you a story, which I hope you'll enjoy. Um, as Andrew said, I'm not a forester. I have a lot of interests in forestry, but I'm not a forester. I'm a structural engineer, and I'm going to talk today about modern timber buildings from sustainable forests. I'm just waiting for my slides to come up on the screen. That's good. Let's go. So I'm, I'm actually, I'm going to start with something rather special. I'm going to start with an earthquake because have a look at the slide. I'm going to talk about the earthquakes which happened in my hometown of Christchurch 2010, 2011, four years ago and three years ago. You have a look at the map. That's a map of the Pacific Rim. And you can see down at bottom left, New Zealand, top right, Utah, where we are today. And we just happened to be at opposite sides of the Pacific Plate. So when I flew here last week, I took a flight from Auckland to San Francisco, and I flew right across the Pacific Plate. And that Pacific Plate is connected to the Australian Plate. These are tectonic plates. And they're moving. They're not moving very fast. They're moving about 40 millimeters a year. It doesn't sound like very much. It means in 10 years, 40 centimeters. It means in 100 years, 4 meters. It means uh, in 300 years, 12 meters. And what we know in New Zealand is that we have that alpine fault, which ruptures about every 300 years. So after the ground moves about 12 meters, the stress has become so great that we have an earthquake. So my hometown is Christchurch, just there. And now I'm going to show you a map of Christchurch. And this is a map after the earthquakes. The first earthquake occurred at half past four in the morning on the 4th of September. I was asleep in bed and the, the room started shaking. And I woke up and it kept shaking and shaking and shaking. And I'm thinking, this is huge. This is a huge earthquake. I wonder where it is. And in fact, that's where it was, where that black arrow is. And the red line there was where the fault ruptured on the surface. So if you look at the slide there, you can see how that fence has been offset because there was a ground rupture right through the surface out in the, the Canterbury Plains. 
And <clears throat> that was a magnitude 7.1 earthquake. Nobody was killed. We all thought how clever we are. And, and the tremors started to die down. <clears throat> but if you have a look at all the green little dots on that map, all the green dots represent the aftershocks from the first earthquake, the September earthquake. But then to our surprise, in February, six months later, we had another aftershock, but that was a bullseye hit on downtown Christchurch. It was only magnitude 6.3. And you can see there all the red dots and the blue dots, those are all the aftershocks over the next 12 months. So what happened with these earthquakes? Well, the first photograph I'm gonna show you is, this is my office. When I went back to my office after the earthquake, that's what happened. The building was fine, but you can see how much shaking there'd been. But outside around the city, we saw all sorts of, all sorts of trouble. So this is a, an old building in Christchurch, partly made of wood, partly made of masonry, and you can see the masonry part has just fallen into the street, and the old wooden part is fine. And these are old masonry buildings which have collapsed. There may be people there, those are workmen. This photograph was taken half an hour after the earthquake. During the second earthquake, the biggest one, I was actually inside that concrete building in the background. I was at an earthquake engineering conference in the Holiday Inn, and the building started shaking, and we all rushed out and got out on the street and went to try and find our families. And you can see there, there are workmen there saying, don't come here, get out of the way, we're under control. But all over the city, there was mess like that, huge lot of mess. And we did, unfortunately, some people died, 182 people died, and, and 115 of them were in that one building on the left, um, and those two reinforced concrete buildings which collapsed. And since then in Christchurch, the population of Christchurch have been very nervous about going back into concrete buildings. Let's look at timber buildings in the earthquake. This is an old timber building. It's nearly fallen over, but not quite. Have a look at this one. This is a three-story apartment building before the earthquake. After the earthquake, it was a two-story apartment building. And uh, there's a story there about a woman who was uh, in the building she went out and got into her car in that carport you can see on the left there, and she remembered she left something upstairs in the house, so she went back up in the house. The earthquake came, the house went down, her car was smashed, and she climbed out the window. She was okay. Lots of stories like that. Lots of other cases where timber buildings collapsed with, with uh, um, damage like this, but luckily not too many. As far as houses go, in New Zealand we build most of our houses with out of light timber framing, two by four construction. And this, there were hundreds, thousands of houses that had damage like this. The house hasn't collapsed. That's a wooden house with wood framing and bricks on the outside. And it's just sunk down because we had liquefaction. The, the ground liquefied because Christchurch was built in an old swampy area. So we had a lot of damage like that. Solid wooden houses behaved extremely well. Um, in all the houses in Christchurch, half a million houses, if you go into any of them, you would find damage to the, the lining, uh, the gypsum board around and some sort of damage. But not a problem, it's easily repaired and that provided the bracing to hold the buildings up. Engineered timber buildings, large buildings like this, almost no damage. Very hard to find any damage at all on these buildings. Why does wood behave better in an earthquake? go back to high school physics. P equals MA, force equals mass times acceleration. The acceleration comes from the ground. If you double the mass, you double the force. Or if you're talking about the comparing concrete with wood, concrete is four times the density of wood, so you get four times the forces when you get the ground acceleration. What about now? If you come to Christchurch now, it's a mess. It looks like that. Most of the city has been demolished. There are still some buildings standing, a few standing like that which are being repaired, but most of them are gone. And why are they gone? Why did they demolish half the city after this earthquake that only killed 180 people? Not many buildings actually collapsed. So why did they have to demolish so many buildings? Well, 
It's a little story like this. It goes back to earthquake engineering, the philosophy of earthquake engineering. What I was taught when I was a young student was simply this. If we have a minor earthquake, we want no damage. Easy. If we have a moderate earthquake, we'll have repairable damage. But what if we get the big one? If we get a really big earthquake, no deaths. Damage is okay. That's the philosophy for earthquake engineering worldwide. And, and that worked if you, in Christchurch. We only lost 200 people, which is almost nothing. Similar earthquake in Haiti two years ago, two years before this, there were a quarter of a million people killed. But the, the problem here is that this is not good enough just to save lives. We have to have low damage buildings. Let's a little bit more earthquake engineering. When we design a building, the structural engineer can decide which kind of behavior we're going to have. The bad behavior on the left or the good behavior on the right. Strong columns and weak beams. That's what we design for. But it's not good enough, actually. It's very expensive to repair. Let me give you an example. Have a look at this 20-story building in Christchurch. That's a beautiful building, almost brand new, and that's the damage. We have plastic hinges in the beams, very good behavior, very expensive to repair. If you go and have a look at that building now, you won't find it. It's gone. It's demolished because it's more expensive to repair it than it is to build a new one. So the insurance company says, knock it down, here's a check, $20 million, $100 million, and that has happened to more than 1,000 buildings in Christchurch. They've been demolished because they were damaged. Now we have to rebuild the city. How are we going to rebuild city? What kind of city do we want? Well, the city, all the people and the politicians have been looking and asking questions about what kind of city do we want, and everybody says the same thing. We want a nice, low rise, people-friendly city, a sustainable city with public transport and bicycle paths, and why not build it all out of wood? And why not wood? We have a tradition in New Zealand of building in wood. This is a building that's more than 100 years old in Wellington in the capital, and it looks like a stone building, but it was built out of wood. Why was it built out of wood? Because of earthquakes, and it survived many earthquakes. Let's just dig into this a little bit further. Why wood? Why would we rebuild the city from wood? Well, the time and cost of construction. We can build buildings very quickly, and they don't need to cost any more than steel or concrete. We're using a renewable resource, which is just locally grown material. Uh, we can make the whole building carbon negative because the embodied carbon is more than the carbon emissions and manufacturing all the building materials in the concrete and the steel and the glass and the windows. Uh, the building is very lightweight, as I mentioned before. We can save money on foundations. Beautiful appearance, excellent performance. So is it happening? Yes, a little bit, but not very much. And why not? Why not wood? Well, we have a very conservative building industry. We have very strong lobbies from the steel and concrete industries. They don't want their buildings to be taken by another material. The designers are not used to designing in wood. The engineers and architects are, are not comfortable with designing in wood. And there are lots of perceptions. And these are only perceptions about fire safety and durability and noise control and thermal insulation. And so the wood industry is trying to overcome these perceptions with some information. I'm just going to step sideways for a minute and talk about fire safety because this is a big one. And a few things about fires and, fires and buildings. We all know that wood burns. There's some problems with combustible surfaces. If we have small pieces of wood, two by four, we have to protect it with something. If we have massive wood, we can rely on the charring. But there is an, a big question about whether the fire will actually burn out or not. Let me, a little bit more. This is a, a time temperature curve. You see temperature here versus time. And this curve shows the sort of temperatures you'd get if you have an uncontrolled fire in a typical bedroom or an office. You'd get, after ignition, you'd get temperatures rising and you'd get what we call flashover after the growth phase. You'd get up to 1,000 degrees. You have a burning period and a decay period. 
The first part of that is the life safety part. That's when people have to get out. The second part of that is the fire resistance part. Of course, if we have automatic sprinkler system in our building, the fire goes out. The sprinklers put the fire out. And if we could rely 100% on sprinklers, we could forget about fire resistance. But we can't rely 100% because, if, because sprinklers may be 95% efficient, but there's always the possibility of an earthquake or a bomb or some maintenance problem. Just quick word about internal surfaces. <clears throat> These photographs came from my colleague in Zurich. That's a, a room with a small fire, and after seven minutes, you can see two cases there. The one on the left is when the internal surfaces were all made of wood. The one on the right is when the internal surfaces were all made of gypsum board. If we have large areas of wood in our buildings, inside the buildings, there is a life safety problem. So we've got to be careful about that. But the big thing is fire resistance. This is not a timber building. This is the first interstate bank building in Los Angeles. 20 years ago, it had a fire up there on the 12th floor and it's a big steel building. And just think about what do we have to do to, what's the fire resistance for? The first thing we have to do is to contain the fire, stop the fire spreading up the building. And the second thing we have to do is to prevent collapse. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and if, if that was a multi-story timber building, it would be exactly the same. So we have to provide enough fire resistance to do both of those things. But there's actually one more thing we have to do, and, and we have to think about what will happen when the fire is gone out? Will it keep burning? Will it keep smoldering? Because if it keeps smoldering and we come back tomorrow and the building has collapsed in the meantime, we've got a very big problem. So that's a problem for, the, for researchers. If we have light timber, we can protect it with gypsum board like that and we get excellent behavior, no problem at all. If we have massive timber, many experiments have shown that with tests, you can put a big timber beam into a furnace you can burn it for an hour, it gets charred on the outside, you cut through it, and inside the wood is undamaged. So, and foresters know that. When you have a forest fire, all the small stuff is burned, burned away after the fire, the big trees are still standing, um, and they're charred on the surface. It's exactly the same in a building, um, and we can take advantage of that. So I'm going to just jump sideways a little bit and say a few quick words about forestry in New Zealand because we have a, a big forest industry which is all based on an exotic species, Monterey pine, radiata pine. There's a forest um, I'm a part owner of that's after four years, that's after eight years, that's after 15 years, and this is harvesting after 30 years. I just harvested this forest a couple of years ago. And those are the logs you see coming out of that forest. Um, what happens to the wood? Well, it's carted out across a timber bridge. But the problem we have in New Zealand is that half of the wood is exported as logs. And everyone's asking the question, why don't we export pre-manufactured timber buildings instead of exporting the logs? So let's come back and talk about engineered wood. Glue lamb, LVL, laminated veneer lumber, CLT, cross-laminated timber. These products are known as engineered wood. It's small pieces of wood glued together into big pieces. Let's go a bit closer. Glued lamb, finger joints. We can make small beams. We can make huge beams. Any, there's no limit on the size, just the size you can get on a truck. Cross-laminated timber. This is the new product. So this is just taking lumber, two by fours, gluing it together into big, thick sheets of plywood, huge sheets. And this is really starting to take off. Um, in Austria, huge industry in Austria, there are now plants in the United States and Canada, other parts of the world. What do you do with cross-laminated timber? Well, you can build buildings like this. This building in London, Murray Grove building, many of you will have seen these pictures before. This is a nine-story building. It's all finished now. There it is, uh, up there, and it was, you can see a truck there. Those were truckloads of cross-laminated timber, and every week another truck arrived from Austria to, to London, and, and this is just increasing very rapidly around the world. So that's a, a product that we've got to work with. 
Another product that I want to talk about is laminated veneer lumber, LVL, um, because the laminated, the LVL industry in New Zealand has been supporting our research for the last 10 years. Have a look at that photograph there. This is a, an LVL factory, but the entire roof of the building is made of LVL. There's no reason why LVL can't re replace steel in large industrial buildings. This is the output of the factory, long, strong planks of wood, which are just three very thin veneers, three millimeter veneers, and LVL changes radiata pine from a commodity to a top class engineering material. We know exactly how strong and stiff it is and we can do lots of things with it. So those are the materials. Now, I'm gonna come back to earthquakes and talk about low damage seismic design. And this, these buildings are not wood, they're concrete. They actually came from the University of California in San Diego 10 years ago. And what the Canadians, uh, sorry, the, the Americans realized in San Diego was that they understood this problem I just described with buildings, concrete buildings, which are very expensive to repair. So they said, why don't we make a prefabricated concrete building which is held together with rubber bands or high strength steel so that even if it rocks in an earthquake, it'll snap back into position. And my Italian colleagues at the University of Canterbury, they'd been part of this, they knew about this. And when they came to New Zealand and they came into my lab where I had big piles of LVL, which I was burning and busting, they said, why don't we try this system with wood? So we did. You see, if you make a big beam out of LVL, it's easy to make a box beam like that with a hollow down the center of it. And the whole idea is this. Imagine you stood up a building like this. You stand up the columns and you drop in some beams. And how do you connect them together? You run a tendon down the center and you clamp it all together. And what you've done is you've made a connection between all the beams and columns just by stressing up this one high strength steel tendon. And we can do the same thing at the next level and the same thing at the next level. And that's the whole idea of a press lamb building, which is held together by high strength steel, which just acts like rubber bands. Or you could put diagonal braces in it, if you like, or you could do it another way with walls, and we can have vertical tendons in the walls, and we can bring in some steel dissipation devices to manage the earthquakes. So that was the concept we came up with uh, nearly 10 years ago, 2006. Um, we got a lot of funding from the LVL industry, some from New Zealand, some from Australia, and we did lots of tests. We tested these things backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards, and we got behavior like this. For the structural engineers in the audience, this is, this is our load deflection plot. And the important thing about this is that we end up with a building that absorbs energy but after the earthquake or after the shaking, it comes right back to where it started. There's no, there is no permanent deformation. We've got high damping and recentering, And this was the concept that the concrete people came up with. We tried it with wood and it worked even better with wood than it did in concrete. So then we built this building. And this is a little two-story building in our lab with frames and walls. And the red lines show the internal tendons which hold it all together. And then we stressed those up with contractors from the pre-stressed concrete industry. And that building went through 20 earthquakes. There was no damage. What are we going to do with it? Well, we decided to t take it down and reassemble it on the campus. And again, you've got the frame there and there's, there are tendons inside there. And that building has been an office for five years and it went through the earthquakes and there was no damage at all because all that other stuff was done before the earthquakes. So this is really starting to, to catch on. Uh, more work we've been doing in our lab with CLT, cross laminated timber you see on the left. It's easy to make cross laminated timber with a duct down the center. You just leave a few boards out and you can put in a little plastic tube there to hold the steel and then you can build a, a, a core there and you can have steel tendons inside there and you can anchor the whole thing down and it will be um, very resistant to any kind of loading. So let's go into real buildings. This is the first real building that was built with this, and this building is half finished. You can see the contractors there are just laying the steel to pour concrete on the floor because 
This is a, a hybrid building. It's a, the floors are what we call timber concrete composite floors, which have got um, concrete on top and timber underneath, and, and that just works fine. So you can see the columns and beams there. Those are the walls out of the end of the building, and those walls are anchored down using the press lamp system I talked about before. You can't see them, they're in there, but those red lines show where the tendons are that anchor those walls down to the foundations. And if you go in at the bottom, that's the engineer who designed the building, and he's just showing the anchor point where those high strength bars are anchored down into the foundation. And if you go into that building now, this is upstairs, this is an arts and media building at a polytechnic institute, and that's an art class, and I went there with my colleague and we, we said to the students, what are those things up there on the walls, up, up there and up there? Oh, didn't you know, they said, this is a special earthquake resistant building and those are the anchors which anchor the walls down to the ground and the ones in the center are the dissipators that dissipate energy. And so these students, they work in the building, they know what it's for and they're very comfortable working there. Um, and so this is something which is starting to happen now is that the architects are wanting to show off the, the, the earthquake resistant parts of the building because people are still scared in Christchurch after the 2010, 2011 earthquakes. So that's that building. Let's look at some more buildings. This is in Wellington, we have Massey University and the top part of that building is all made of LVL. Uh, you can see those big timber columns holding the building up. This is the engineer's drawing for this. And the engineer got a bit more clever now and said, instead of using straight tendons, I'm going to use deviated tendons. I'm going to curve them like this. And this is just another idea stolen from the pre-stressed concrete industry. This is what pre-stressed concrete is all about. It's, if you like, it's almost like having little suspension bridges inside the building. And in this building, you can actually see these. So that was the building under construction. Those are the tendons, they've just been stressed on the outside of the building. And if you go into the building, you can see them. So those tendons go right into the building, they go down to a, a deviator and then along and come up again. And they're holding the whole building together, they're reducing the deflections, they're making the building more economical to build, and they're providing the earthquake resistance, they're doing every, everything at once. There is one problem with that, however, there is a problem with fire safety in this building because those tendons are not protected from fire. So the engineer had to do some special calculations to show that, to show that if there was a fire, the building would still stand up even without the tendons. But under normal day-to-day -day activity, they're working very hard and they're working even harder under an earthquake. So there's a trade-off between the different, different demands on the building. This is the same building nice big open spaces. And the difference, if we go back to the, the CLT building I showed earlier, if you're building a, a building with big flat panels, that is just great for residential buildings. But if you want to build an open plan office building, you've got to find another way of doing it. And if you want to do it with wood, this seems to be a, a, a good way of going. Let's go back to Christchurch. There's some more buildings in Christchurch. This is the architect's drawing of a new building in Christchurch. Um, all ready to go. That's the, that was the engineer's plan of the building, just a three-story building, all prefabricated wood with, with tendons. This is this, then because the engineer wasn't quite sure about it, we, and we had the time, we built a prototype of the building and took it into our lab, and that's a full-size column and beam in the lab being tested, and that's all been stressed, and it's been rocked, and it's gone backwards and forwards through many earthquakes just to demonstrate the principle. And then on the building site, these are frames being stressed with the stressing, and then you can see those H-shaped frames being erected. So the truck shows a load of, of uh, LVL, which has come from Auckland, and then it's stressed on the site, then they're stood up like that, and then there all the frames are stood up, and then the floors are put in. And if you go into the building, it looks like that. It's been finished now, but this is what it looked like. So what do we see there? We see columns and beams, which are solid or almost solid with a duct down the center. We can see the floor up above is LVL floor and plywood and with concrete on top, timber concrete composite floor. And 
If you look more closely at that detail, the question is, what, what's that? What can you see there? Well, these are special. This is the, what we call the, the dissipators. If there is an earthquake, another earthquake, the damage will all be in those devices. Remember this photograph. I showed it to you before. This is the concrete building, which had some damage. And that concrete building had to be demolished. But what we're saying is, why don't you do it this way? And after the earthquake, if there is another big earthquake, you can just take those those dissipators out. You can go down to the DIY store. You can bring back some new ones. You can put them back in and you can repair your building and there'll be no damage. And if the, if the design is right, there'll be no damage to any of the uh, non-structural elements at all. So that's the, the concept. And that building there, is, you can see, almost finished. Um, and it's a very attractive building. And so what's happening now in Christchurch is that there's a number of buildings like this, um, but it's not as easy as you think because, as I said before, the steel and concrete lobby are fighting this. They don't like to, to see the wood people taking over their buildings, and so things have, have slowed down and, and the timber industry is going to have to start uh, doing some more science, some more engineering, and some more marketing to demonstrate that, that this is possible. This is another building in Christchurch where you can see all the same kind of stuff again in a different way. And if you look at the photograph on the right, this is the building just as it was being completed and the carpet is down. And you can see at the base of that column, there's a special, that dissipating device or the external reinforcing has just been recessed there and it could have been covered up with plywood, but no, let's put a plexiglass sheet over it to show it off so that visitors to the building can, can see what's happening and, and, and see all that stuff. This is another building in Kaikoura. Anyone's been to New Zealand, this is where you go to go whale watching or swimming with the dolphins. And this, build, this picture here is just an architect's rendering of the building. Just a nice little three-story building, all timber, no concrete above the ground, and post-tensioned walls. And so if you have a look at the building now, it's under construction. And what's happening here is this is combining a whole lot of things which haven't been combined before. Those walls there are CLT walls. And you can see the, the openings left in the walls up at the top there to anchor down the post-tensioning. So the CLT walls have got some boards left out for anchoring. Um, but more than that, these walls, when the engineer did the calculations, the wood wasn't strong enough. So what they've done is they've taken some LVL and they've glued some LVL planks into the CLT. So it's kind of a special cross-laminated timber with LVL combined and it's all been post-tensioned. And it's, um, that building is, that's what it looks like now. In fact, the last photograph I took was up on, on the top, a beautiful view of the ocean and the mountains from that, from that building. Um, the same principle can be used for what we call big box construction. This is actually a community center in, in, uh, near Wellington, but it could be a, a, a high school, a, a gymnasium, or it could be a, a big, big box retail. And all those, all the lateral load resistance for wind and earthquake is all taken by those walls which are anchored down to the ground. And up on the roof, you can see some big roof trusses. That's all LVL uh, roof trusses up there. Uh, this is getting towards the end now. Uh, this is a building which I, I know a lot about because when I was a consulting engineer before I joined the university, I had my office in this building. And if you look closely at that, you'll see some damage. You won't see it from the back of the room, but that was another building which was badly damaged by the earthquake. And the, of course, you can see it didn't collapse. No one was killed or injured. But when the, the assessment was made, that building has to come down. And so <clears throat> here's the demolition contractor knocking the building down. And <clears throat> this has to be replaced. So the, the, the architect, this is the architect's impression of a new timber building to go up there five or six story timber building going up. And these are the, this is the engineer's drawing of the plan and the elevation. And 
in this case, it's a bit different because there are no walls in this building, and so the, the columns were being stressed a great deal, and so this is what we call hybrid construction. It's hybrid materials. So you can see here those vertical columns are made of concrete, but the, the beams are all LVL beams, and they've, they're big, big fat beams which are hollow with tendons running through the center to anchor the whole thing together. And this building is also on, on base isolation. So this is really <coughs> combining the latest of, of all these materials. And that's the building as it stands now with the windows starting to, to, to go up. So that's my story. This is starting to happen around the world. I mean, there are plenty of tall timber buildings. In, if you go to Berlin or to, or to Switzerland or to Canada, lovely buildings at UBC, some of you will know. This is ha happening worldwide. And the big question for us is, how much of our forest production can go into sustainable timber buildings like this? Let's look into the future. These, none of these buildings have been built. These are plans for the future. <clears throat> the Norwegians are talking about a 20-story tower. The Canadians are talking about 30 stories. It's a very well-known Canadian architect, Michael Green, who's been promoting this. And, and, he, he, um, and with the support of the Canadian government, Canadian industry. The building on the right is a proposal in Chicago for a 42-story timber building from Skidmore, Owings and Merrill. So there are reports out on all those buildings. Is it possible? Of course it's possible. The market's not going to be for those such tall buildings, but those things will be happening. And to actually make it happen more closely, there are now, what we're now seeing is that governments are getting involved and the Canadian government is promoting a design competition and they call for expressions of interest from developers and architects and engineers and the photograph there is an artist's impression of a building in Ottawa. And I know quite a lot about this building because I'm going to be helping the designer of that building. It's going to be a 14-story timber office building. And the Canadian government is putting in funds to help the design of that building because they know that it won't happen without some seed funding. And the Canadian government have another building in Quebec City and a third one in Vancouver, which they're supporting like that. And here in the US, this is just taken off the website yesterday. This has just been an announcement in the last few weeks that the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the Forest Service are promoting a tall wood building prize competition in the U.S. The details aren't yet out yet, but there's a website there. So this is very exciting. That photograph is not a U.S. photograph. That's from Sweden. That's at Vaksha in Sweden where you're seeing this sort of thing happening. So there's a lot of momentum and, it, and it's just growing. So I have some conclusions. My conclusions are very simple. The more trees that we plant and grow and harvest and use for sustainable buildings and replant, the better it is for our health and our wealth and a sustainable planet. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Andy Butchinen. Certainly, wood is good. The more wood you use, the more you are doing good turns for the environment. And um, I must just say, spend one minute just saying that there is a connection between myself and Andy for, for, for one point. I come from the University of Malaysia, Sarawak, and I was delighted to know that Andy, during his early days as a young adult, had spent several months as, as, in his, in, as a teacher in Sarawak too. So that's where the connection is. And I would like to take this opportunity to throw open the floor for questions and comments. There are two mics, if, as you can see. If you can have the lights up, please. There's one mic there and there's one mic there, both in the middle of the hall. And I'm sure there's some burning questions in your mind or some statements you'd like to make. Please identify, uh, name yourself and your affiliation before you post the question to Professor Andy Butchanen. I'd like to invite Andy to, to be here to entertain questions that you might have. So, yes, we'll have the first question. 
the mic is at the back. Yeah. My name is Udo Sauter. I'm from Freiburg in Germany, and my um, institution is called the Forest Research Institution of Baden-Württemberg, owned by this southwest state in Germany. We are dealing somehow with um, wood products research. And my question is from a, um, a special German uh, point of view, uh, Andy, uh, could you think of such solutions also set up with um, hardwoods, hardwood products? Yes. So the, the question is, could we do the same thing with hardwoods? And uh, of course, the reason that we use radiata pine is it's because what we grow and what we have available to us. Um, that last building I showed where the co the, we had concrete columns because the radiata pine is, no, is not strong in compression perpendicular to grain. I, my colleagues in, in Zurich, at ETH in Zurich, are building a building now which is almost completed and they are using ash for the columns and the floors they're using beech, beech concrete composite. So any species, the, the stronger the wood, the better. But the nice thing about this is that you can use a very low quality wood and still get a good result. Thank you. Do I see any? Oh, yes, please. Hello, my name is uh, John Innes. I'm from UBC in Canada. We are considering a building um, there and there's currently a premium on the use of wood. And that's because of the number of uncertainties that are involved in building something that's never been built before. How long do you think it will be before there is no such premium, that we know how to build tall wooden buildings well enough that they can really compete effectively against uh, steel and concrete buildings? OK, so the question, I think, is, how long will it take before wood can really compete with steel and concrete? And the, the, the problem, of course, is that steel and concrete have been around for a long time. I mean, the last 100 years or more. Of course, wood has been a building material for thousands of years. But these new concepts of tall wood buildings are very new, and it's going to take time. And Part of the problem is this. If you think about the supply chain, going from the forest, growing trees in the forest and ending up with a timber building, it's a very long supply chain. And there are many players along the supply chain. There's the, the, there's the tree grower and the wood processor. Then there's the building owner and the bank that lends the money to the building owner and the structural engineer and the architect and the fire engineer and the acoustics engineer, and the geotechnical engineer, and the cost consultant, the quantity surveyor, and the builder who's going to build the building. And you have to convince all those people. And what we find is that if there's just one person along that supply chain who says, I'm a bit nervous about this, not this time, next time, then it doesn't happen. And so people are concerned about risk. How do you, how do you manage risk? You provide confidence. And it's only you and I and the research community that have to do the, the t testing of these things and the design community. The f people who build the first ones are very, very important because they can reduce the risk of those people. So it's going to happen. And just when, I can't say, but it certainly is happening and it will happen. Thank you. I have a question, a question from Professor Niels. Elas Katz, Nils Elas Katz, University of Copenhagen. Have you tried to quantify how much carbon, side, carbon dioxide potential could be stored in those buildings global? I think that could be a huge amount, and the figure could be very interesting to calculate what are the potential for storing carbon dioxide in those kind of buildings. Thank you. Yes, that's, so that's a question about how much carbon is stored in the wood and what's the benefit of wood buildings on the, the global carbon cycle. And that's a, a very big question, and there's going to be some sessions about this at the conference, and I was talking to Professor Klaus Richter at morning tea. He's somewhere in the audience. Um, and so I, I didn't cover this, but 
the short story is it's a very good story because there is a large amount of carbon locked up in the building and when we've done a carbon inventory of these buildings we find that the carbon stored in the structure more than offsets all of the carbon needed to manufacture the steel and the concrete and the glass and the gypsum board. But there are some questions because if you're looking, if you're doing a life cycle analysis, what are the system boundaries of your life cycle analysis? And if you, are you going to include the end of life of the building in, in 200 years time? And if so, what's going to happen to the wood in 200 years time? Is it going to be burned or reused or recycled? So it's, it's actually not so easy to, to make the calculations. The other thing I would simply say about that is that we have these green building programs like, like LEED and, and Green Star, and they should be encouraging the use of wood, but they really they don't, they don't address these issues properly. So there's a good story, but it's hard to tell. Thank you. I'm not sure who was first, uh, but I would like to give you Professor Richter, a chance? Yes. Okay, this is Klaus Richter from Technical University in Munich. And uh, first of all, thank you very much, Andy, for this uh, very interesting and very informative talk. I will come back to the further question about trust and reliability of, of our timber built constructions. I, I think that when, especially the insurances, take into account that there is a proper value, even in cases of, uh, of um, earthquakes in the constructions. This should give also stimulus in order to give more confidence into our, um, into our constructions. How was your reaction and your attitude, especially in your country, when you said we will like to give more trust on timber constructions after this earthquake? Do you also have seen that financial um, groups have proper attitude to, to give more confidence into timber constructions instead of concrete and steel. And you are right, we have a very big uh, attitude against timber constructions because the other industry, industries have much more time to show their values, but we have seen they are not uh, so, so good in all the problems we have to, to face. So, well. The question is, yeah, what is are the question? insurances interested in give more reliability and trust and confidence into timber buildings oh. if we don't look only into the construction period but also over the all lifetimes of materials until end of life? Then okay. timber should get more proper uh, benefits. Okay, so the, the, I think the question is this. If we look at the entire lifetime of the building, there are what are the benefits and are they taken into account? And especially with insurance. Yes. <clears throat> and there are some problems here because it's easy to say to a building owner, look, we can give you an earthquake proof building and it may cost a little more now, but when we have the earthquake, you'll save some money. Building owners are not interested yes. <laughs> because they're interested in the, the initial cost. And the insurance industry actually is not very interested either. What the insurance industry want to know is what's the probability of the earthquake. They don't have a vested interest in reducing damage. So I'm not sure if I've answered your question, but that's well, best. I have the same, the same feeling when I go into discussions with those people, but what are our arguments and how can we include these important periods or, or pieces of, uh, of um, into the into the overall calculation of a construction, not until it is put in service, but also after the end of all living uh, periods of such construction. Yes, well, all I'll say is that's very important and we, we do have to create that argument, yeah. but we're always going to be fighting against the, the developer who wants the cheapest uh, initial cost. Okay, well, thank you, thank Professor Klaus. We can take more questions very soon, but next, next person, yeah. Mary Terrell from the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. Um, this is fantastic. We've seen a lot of progress in the last five or so years on more and more uh, work, engineering and architecturally, on these timber buildings. Um, all the examples you've talked about were in the temperate zone countries. And I know Michael Green, who, who I've met, as, uh, is a big proponent of the, of the huge benefit that these kind of buildings could be in uh, developing 
countries with megacities and lots of sprawling 20 and 30 story buildings. And I'm wondering if you have any examples where maybe there are some inroads being made in tropical countries in, in sort of megacity situations. So I think the question was, do I have any examples from developing countries where this technology has been used? The answer is not yet, but I'm sure it will come. Next. Oh, Leon Green from the University of Melbourne. I have a uh, double bunger question. The first is, how do the windows survive in the earthquake with the wooden buildings? And the second is that when the building has reached its uh, end of its economic life, if you demolish a, a concrete building, there's usually not very much recoverable. Presumably, in this case, the beams and columns could be reused. Thanks. Okay, so the first question was about how, how do the windows behave when we have an earthquake? That, that's correct. And, and so the, the question, it's, that goes back to the design of the building. The, we had lots of older buildings in Christchurch where the windows broke and the glass fell in the street. It was dangerous. But the modern buildings, does, there is, the building codes now put a limit on how much movement you can have even in the worst possible earthquake. And they talk about 2% of the story height. So if you have a three meter story height, you're talking about 60 millimeters or seven, up, no more than three inches movement. And the, the, the facade engineers who design the facade then have to make sure that they have flexible fastenings. So there's a whole, if you go to an earthquake engineering conference, you'll find whole groups of people talking about this part. It's, 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 uh, it, it's interesting, but it, 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 the, it can be solved. Sorry, what was the second question? Um, when the building's reached at the end of its economic life, presumably all these beams oh, and columns sure. can be uh, recovered. Well, look, of, of course. And that little building I showed you on the campus, that was tested, it was dismantled, it was re-erected, it's now been sold to a, a, a lawyer, he's going to take it apart and put it again. So that could happen for a thousand years. It's certainly possible, but it, it depends on the architecture. Thank you. Uh, could I ask the, the, the following audience, we have about five minutes to go, to uh, post quick questions yes. so that we can get it done. Thank you. Werner Kurt, Werner Kurt's Canadian Forest Service. Um, I'm interested from the carbon perspective and this is a great presentation, but I'm surprised at the focus of large buildings, 40 stories, 30 stories, because as the penultimate questioner pointed out, in the developing world, we have a need for tens of millions of housing units. So wouldn't we be far better off from a carbon perspective if we designed multi-purpose uh, multi buildings, three, four stories that are built out of wood that can be built by, in mass construction in New Zealand, around the world, wherever, shipped to these earthquake-prone countries like China, for example, and allow them to build you know, hundreds of thousands, if not more, units uh, rather than a few high-profile towers. Yes, so the, the question, I understand precisely what you're saying, and the question, I agree with you. I mean, what I'm talking about here, because what our research, what we were funded to do was to look at, at commercial office buildings directly competing with steel and concrete. But the, the, the wood construction industry, the timber industry, there's an enormous market, huge market for, for housing for not millions, but billions of people with prefabricated wooden buildings. There are a lot of people working on it and I encourage them, but it, I have to say, I, I, personally, I don't have experience in that. Thank you. Thank you. Could I, the next speaker please address a short question? Yes. Hi, Andy. My name is Joey Holbert. I'm a grad student at Oregon State University. Excuse me, Oregon State University. Can okay. you put yourself was, closer to the mic, please? I was curious if you could comment on the, um, whether termites are an issue in New Zealand and whether they have been an issue in Christchurch. And okay, also, question about termites. Is that the ahead. question? Yes, sir. Yes, the first thing is in New Zealand, we do not have a, any termites. So we're very lucky, we're a small island. We have no snakes and no termites. But, <laughs> but um, in terms of, one thing I will say is that one, we have an adhesive manufacturer in New Zealand who, when you have laminated veneer lumber with thin layers and they have an insecticide which they put in the glue line 
and they're about to release this now for termite protection in Australia, um, which is a, a, a new way of doing dealing with that. Okay. So it sounds like if, if we're going to start building more woods, more buildings out of wood, that there, there'd probably be more research in that field. I beg your pardon? There'd probably be more research in terms of termite resistance if we we're going to start building more buildings out of wood. I apologize if this echo is bothering me. Sure. So, I mean, my colleague here is a wood protection expert and, and there's, there is so much work to be done yeah. because we have to solve all these problems. Wood buildings are not going to become successful until we've got answers for the earthquake, for the fire, for the termites, for the durability, for the noise, for the thermal performance. We have to solve all those things. Yeah. Thank you. We'll, we'll talk later about your interest there. But we have time for two questions. And uh, who is first? You? OK. Uh, Quick one. Xi Ping Wang with the U.S. Forest Service uh, Forest Products Laboratory. And you touch on the fire safety issues uh, for timber structures. Um, there is a pro probably potential bigger problem for timber structures is uh, water issue and moisture issues. So from designing and maintain maintenance perspective, are there any measures has been considered as regard to water damage? So, are you asking about fire safety? No, the water, water issues. Which, what is it? Water damage. Water. Oh, water it's damage. Water, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I. This is a, you know this is a big big problem to all the timber uh, structures. When wood is dry and it performs very well, but when wood is getting wet, it's not being taken care of, and that's caused problems and uh, potentially cause decay damage. Okay, so yes, your concern is about water damage to the wood. Yes. And, and the, look, very, very important. And water from two or three sources, <clears throat> we have to be concerned about weatherproofness and water coming in from outside the building. And we've had a big problem with houses in that regard. The second area of water coming is just leaking plumbing from the bath and the shower. And the third one, which is the most important one, is moisture from human activities which is, in, especially in cold climates where the water, the moisture condenses. And this, again, I'm a structural engineer. I, I have to talk to a building physicist about this, but it, because where you put the vapor barrier, where you put the insulation, where's the dew point? Very, very important. Um, and I, I'll just reinforce that. Thank you. Thank you. Although we are running a little bit over time, but because this is an interesting topic, I will allow for one more question, a quick one from, from the gentleman. Okay, my, my name is Malcolm Beatty. I'm from the UK and I work for the State Forestry Organization in Northern Ireland. My question is about the, the glues. Uh, how satisfied are you about the quality of the glues, their longevity, and about the manufacture? So the question about the glue, the adhesive? Yeah. Yes, well, again, I, I'm a structural engineer. I'm not an adhesive chemist. But many people ask us that because they look at the, the wood, they say this wood is a renewable resource, what about the glue? Well, all of the manufacturers that we deal with, they're using petrochemical adhesives. And what I'm told is that there are a lot of, there's a lot of work going on to try and develop organic adhesives using tannin and stuff like that. And the sooner it comes, the better. That's all I can say. Thank you very much uh, for all the good questions and comments. Uh, and thank you also especially to Professor Andy Buchanan for giving us a very good insight about the potential users of wood and how high the building can become. Thank you. For now, I'll pass the, the baton over to Richard, who will do some housekeeping announcements for you. Thank you. I have three housekeeping announcements. The first, some have asked where there is Wi-Fi. Uh, there are free Wi-Fi hotspots in the south foyer where the registration area was, in the north foyer where the uh, IUFRO um, booth is, also uh, by the circular tables on the second level uh, at the far end of the corridor. And then lastly, when you enter the poster uh, area, you'll notice a small uh, set of uh, couches and chairs, sofas and chairs, 
uh, with a cream colored carpet on the floor. There is a Wi-Fi hotspot there in that lounge. So those are the four areas of the building where there is free Wi-Fi. Secondly, so many of you are carrying bags around and we've already had some people misplace theirs. So inside the bag is a green luggage tag. We'd ask each person to put your name um, and either your cell phone or your uh, email address on that luggage tag or your Twitter hashtag. And, um, and that way if you do misplace it and we find it, we can get in touch with you and return your bag to you. So please use the green luggage tags uh, to label your bag and keep track of them. And then finally, uh, there's been unprecedented interest, at least from the COC's perspective, in people uh, going back and forth about which in Congress tour they want to attend. And there's been a great deal of switching. Um, tonight, at 1800 hours, the ability to switch ends. And uh, if you still have a desire to switch your tour, then you must visit the tour uh, kiosk in the registration area and see if there is still bus seat available in the tour that you would like to go on. And when you make that change, then we free up the seat that you formerly had. There can be no changes in in-Congress field tours after six o'clock this evening. Okay, enjoy your lunch and um, be ready for the afternoon sub-plenary sessions that start at 1.30 this afternoon.